Now coming to the conclusion of our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1246 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Orlando Hamcation has announced its 2023 award winners. We will introduce you to them. Parks on the Air has released its numbers and participation for 2022. We will have a live report. The FCC votes to establish a new Space Bureau and a new Office of International Affairs. The United States has begun installing a powerful new over-the-horizon radar system in Palu. The FCC adopts a notice proposing to allocate spectrum for unmanned aircraft command. The AWRL Volunteers on the Air year-long event is now underway. We will have the details. Hams are exempt from a new distracted driving law going into effect in the state of Ohio. The next virtual meeting of the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Group is coming up. We will tell you how you can attend. Spectro Rep releases the results of its next-gen TV emergency communications test. HARP thanks Amateur Radio and the scientific community for help with its most recent asteroid experiment. Amateurs in Australia are facing higher fees as we enter the new year. Summits on the Air has announced camping trip activations in upstate New York, and the Chinese Mars rover hasn't woken up from its Martian winter hibernation. We will have the story and a whole lot more in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our new technology reporter, KTLA's own Rich DeMuro and Rich on Tech, will introduce himself and then talk about how hackers get your passwords and how you can prevent it. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will answer the question, where does propagation data come from? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill roams through the 50s and 60s to find out why the technician class licensee was always considered an outcast in the early days of that license class. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will tell you all the ways you have available to avoid what he calls the sudden stop. And we will have the latest news from Parks on the Air with N3MWV. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio just outside Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Reporting live from just outside the capital of New York State in Glenmont, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where the winter doldrums seem to be getting to everyone, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we have found old man Winter and he's really packing a punch. And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, ducking for cover. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, just a month ahead of its big event in Florida, the Orlando Hamcation has announced the 2023 Hamcation Award winners. Ken Lyons, KN4MDJ, and Jim Storms, AB8YK, are the 2023 recipients of the Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award. The award is given to individuals who have made outstanding contributions to educating and advancing youth in amateur radio. It was first awarded at Hamcation 2019 to its namesake, Carol Perry, WB2MGP, in honor of her work as an educator teaching students about ham radio. Lyons is an AWRL Southeastern Division Assistant Director for Radio Scouting. 
and is the trustee of WB4SA, the Central Florida Council's radio scouting program, for activities and opportunities in both the Boy Scout and Girl Scout programs covered by Division II. The program includes 30,000 scouts in nine counties. Lyons has been licensed since 2018 and now holds an amateur extra class license. On receiving his award, Lyons said, I was not expecting the award, but I'm honored to receive it. Storms is a co-founder and a current team leader for the Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure. He co-founded the Youth DX Adventure in 2010 with Dave Coulter, KB8OCP, now Silent Key. He has been licensed since 2007 and holds an amateur extra class license. He's also an ARRL member and general chairman of 2023 Dayton Hamvention. John Bigley, N7UR, is the 2023 Hamcation recipient of the Gordon West Ambassador of the Year Award. This is the first time the award's been presented. The award honors its namesake, Gordon West, WB6NOA, in honor of his contributions and inspirations to the amateur radio community. Bigley is the ARRL Nevada Section Manager and was chosen as the 2014 ARRL Pacific Division Ham of the Year. He has been licensed since 2003 and holds an amateur extra class license. Bigley's reaction to receiving the award was... surprised? Absolutely. Orlando Hamcation has been sponsored by the Orlando Amateur Radio Club since 1946 and is held annually on the second weekend in February. Hamcation has grown to become the second largest ham fest in the world. 2023 Hamcation is February 10th through the 12th and will host the ARRL Southeastern Division Convention at the Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando. Visit hamcation.com for more information. That's hamcation.com. Administrators from Parks on the Air have spent the past few days tallying up activator totals for 2022. Here is Matt here, N3NWV from Parks on the Air with all of the details. Howdy, POTA folks. I'm Matt, N3NWV, and this is the December 22 monthly POTA update, which is our 2022 year-end wrap-up. So instead of December statistics, let's talk about how 2022 stacked up against 2021. In terms of total activations, there were 141,477. That's a 195% increase over the previous year. 7,187 activators participated in these activations, which is a 171% increase over 2021. In total, 14,818 parks were activated, a 134% increase over 2021. These parks are spread out across 72 DXCC entities, 147% increase over 2021. And drumroll please, we logged over 6.26 million QSOs in 2022. That's a 220% increase, more than double what we logged in 2021. And as you might expect with the maturity of the POTA program, a lot of the growth is happening outside of the United States. In IARU Region 1, we had 5,940 activators. That's a 418% increase over 2021, four times as many activators in Region 1. Mike Zero, Oscar, Victor, Golf was the most active activator with 257 activations. And Echo Alpha 2, Echo Zulu topped the QSO list with just shy of 46,000 total contacts. Fantastic numbers for Region 2 outside of the continental U.S. as well. 11,630 activations represents a 267% increase over 2021. The gold stars go to Hotel India 8 Delta with 973 activations. Pretty impressive. And Victor Echo 3 Tango Hotel Romeo with just over 37,000 total QSOs. Last but by no means least, Region 3's 8,780 QSOs represents a 283% increase over 2021. Juliet Fox 7, Romeo Juliet Mike made a clean sweep of both activations and QSOs with 468 and 21,700 respectively. Now those are some fantastic numbers any way you slice it, but where does it leave POTA the program as a whole? Well, as of January 8th, 2023, when this is being recorded, the POTA program is just a couple shy of 32,000 registered users. There are slightly more than 37,000 total park entities defined in the database. There are 81 DXCC entities with parks defined, and all 81 of them have at least one activation logged. 17,600 parks have been activated at least once. There are 8,930 unique call signs in the list of activators. 
There are more than 343,000 unique call signs listed as hunters in the CUSO table. And that CUSO table lists 11.3 million total POTA contacts. There are obviously a whole lot of people who are active in POTA. We thank each and every one of you. You all are the key to making this work and making it enjoyable for everybody. There are, however, a select few whose dedication to POTA goes above and beyond what most of us are able to pull off. And those are the winners of our Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge. By the end of 2022, 24 were left standing in the hunter category for the Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge. Collectively, these 24 operators accumulated well over 100,000 QSOs, and each and every one of them worked over 1,000 parks. Very well done to all 24 who completed the challenge in the hunter category, and thanks for your dedication to sitting in front of that radio all 365 days. And finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, we have six, yeah, count them six, survivors of the activator version of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. These six intrepid individuals managed to get out there and do a POTA activation all 365 days of calendar year 2022. Those six are Kilo 4, November, Yankee, Mike, Bill, Kilo Bravo 3, Whiskey, Alpha, Victor, Carrie, Kilo Delta 4, Mike, Zulu, Mike, Eric, Kilo Echo 8, Papa, Zulu, November, James, November 2, November, Whiskey, Kilo, Dell, and Whiskey, Charlie, 1, November, Robert. If you hunt parks on the air, the odds are that you've worked one, if not all six of these activators. To call them pillars of the POTA community would be the understatement of 2022. Thank you and well done to all six of these truly first class operators. Judging by the database, they're at it again in 2023. So good luck there too. So that'll put a wrap on our wrap up of 2022. Thanks one and all for your participation and help with the POTA program. A happy new year and best of luck in 2023. ARRL's year-long operating event, Volunteers on the Air, or VOTA, began on New Year's Day, January 1st, 2023. John Ross, KB8, IDJ, is at League Headquarters with all the details on this exciting event. The event is organized as part of ARRL's 2023 theme, Year of the Volunteers, which recognizes the contributions of ARRL member volunteers and offers opportunities to become more active and involved in amateur radio and ARRL. VOTA encourages participants to make contacts with ARRL members and volunteers earning points for each contact. Point values have been assigned, and you are able to see the points table now at vota.arrl.org. All scoring is automatically calculated through ARRL's Logbook of the World. If you're already a Logbook of the World user, continue to upload your QSOs there to participate. If you're a new Logbook of the World user, visit the website Getting Started with Low TW. As part of the event, there will be week-long activations by W1AW and portable stations operating in all U.S. states and territories. W1AW portable operations are worth five points for each contact, and they will be contacted on all bands and modes. There will also be an opportunity to earn the W1AW Worked All States Award, and there will be two week-long W1AW operations from each of the 50 states. Later in the event, an online scoreboard, the VOTA Leaderboard, will be activated, allowing each participant to see how their score measures up with other participants throughout the year. Join the fun. Visit the official VOTA website for further details, vota.arrl.org. I'm John Ross, KD8, IDJ. Only two-way contacts qualify for points. However, cross-band, cross-mode, and repeater contacts are not valid. You can use any mode, CW, phone, or digital, including Earth, Moon, Earth, and satellite operations on 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, 2, and 1.25 meters, as well as 70 centimeters, VHF, UHF, SHF, and microwave bands available to U.S. amateurs above 2 meters. 2190, 630, 60, 30, 17, and 12 meter band contacts are not counted for credit in this event. Visit the official Volunteers on the Air website for further details. That address again is vota.arrl.org.
www.arrl.org. Earlier this week, the Federal Communications Commission released an order adopting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel's plan to modernize the FCC by establishing a Space Bureau and Office of International Affairs. The planned reorganization will better support the needs of the growing satellite industry, promote long-term technical capacity at the FCC, and help the agency navigate 21st century global communication policy. As part of this plan, the agency will be eliminating the current International Bureau and incorporating the team into the new bureau and office. The satellite industry is growing at a record pace, but here on the ground, our regulatory frameworks for licensing have not kept up. We're working to change that. Today, we are moving forward with our plan to prepare for what comes next, said Chairwoman Rosenworcel. A new space bureau at the FCC will ensure that the agency's resources are appropriately aligned to fulfill its statutory obligations, improve its coordination across the federal government, and support the 21st century satellite industry. I also thank my fellow commissioners for their support. This week's action is the latest initiative in the FCC's space innovation agenda. As part of this agenda, the FCC has taken action to speed up regulatory review processes, increase the size of the FCC's satellite division by 38%, create new opportunities for competition in the delivery of satellite broadband services, and modernize spectrum policy to better meet the needs of the next generation space age. The Space Bureau will consist of three divisions, the Satellite Programs and Policy Division, the Satellite Licensing Division, and the Earth Station Licensing Division. These new divisions will have responsibilities and authorities for the analysis and functions currently housed within the Satellite Division of the International Bureau, including its branches, the Policy Branch, the Engineering Branch, and the Systems Analysis Branch. The Office of International Affairs will consist of the Global Strategy and Negotiation Division and the Telecommunications and Analysis Division. The Global Strategy and Negotiation Division will be moved to the Office of International Affairs from the International Bureau as currently organized, including each of its existing branches, and will maintain its current responsibilities and authorities. Similarly, the Telecommunications and Analysis Division will be moved to the Office of International Affairs from the International Bureau is currently organized and will maintain its current responsibilities and authorities. As the agency promotes space innovation, it also has taken actions to advance space safety and responsibility, including by adopting new rules for deorbiting satellites to address orbital debris risks. The FCC will next seek congressional and other approvals for the planned reorganization and make formal notice in the Federal Register. Bud Kozlov, W1NSK, has been appointed as the ARRL Connecticut Section Manager starting on January 1, 2023. For more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. Kozlov, who lives in Reading, Connecticut, is currently the president of the Candlewood Amateur Radio Association and a member of the Yankee Clipper Contest Club. He was appointed by ARRL Field Service Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, after consulting with the New England Division Director Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC. His term of office continues through September 30, 2024. Kasloff takes a uh, reins of the Connecticut Section Organization from Betsy Doan, K1EIC, who was appointed by ARRO headquarters as the Connecticut Section Manager in November 2022 to fulfill the role on a temporary basis until a full-time Section Manager could be appointed. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Betsy Doan of Shelton was previously the Connecticut Section Manager for 25 years from 1991 to 2016. Chuck Motes, K1DFS of Plainville, served as Connecticut Section Manager for the last six years. He decided not to run for a new term of office when his third term concluded on September 30, 2022. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel issued a statement saying that an assessment of spectrum resources dedicated to remote piloted aircraft was long overdue. The FCC is studying the range between 5.030 gigahertz and 5.091 gigahertz, frequencies that are below the range typically used in the U.S. and other countries for other low-powered, unlicensed wireless devices using frequencies that start at 5.15 gigahertz. In the U.S., the FCC limits the maximum channel width used by unlicensed devices to prevent interference with users on the licensed portion of the spectrum. The frequencies being looked at by the Commission are not within the amateur band between 5.650 and 5.850 GHz. 
The FCC collaborated with the Federal Aviation Administration and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and developed the notice within the federal government's interdepartmental radio advisory committee process. The FCC asked for comment on the following topics, which it believes will help promote the growth and safety of UAS operations. Examining the FCC's proposal to adopt service rules permitting UAS communications links in the 5.030 to 5.091 GHz band and whether it will provide the reliability necessary to support safety-critical UAS communications. Assessing what steps must be taken to ensure that UAS use can coexist with terrestrial service spectrum operations like mobile wireless networks. Requiring UAS operators to obtain licenses in the aeronautical very high frequency band of 117.975 to 137 MHz to communicate with air traffic control and other aircraft while maintaining the integrity of the band. Promoting the safe integration of UAS operations in controlled airspace and facilitating flight coordination. Those involved in the unmanned aircraft industry should consider participating in the FCC's proceeding. The FCC is likely to provide spectrum that will be a critical input for remote pilots to communicate with UAS, but the specific terms of the rules will affect how unmanned aircraft systems may be manufactured and operated. The chairwoman said that the FCC also acknowledges that unmanned aircraft are also vital to first responders and in disaster recovery and wildfire situations. She said the proposal was developed with input from the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and the Federal Aviation Administration. Comments and reply comments will be due 30 days and 60 days respectively after the notice is published in the Federal Register. According to the Springfield News Sun newspaper, under a new law taking effect in Ohio, if you're holding a cell phone or similar device in your hands while operating a motor vehicle, that is sufficient reason for you to be stopped by the police. It is considered a primary offense. Hams, however, needn't worry. The distracted driving law exempts radio amateurs as well as utility workers and first responders such as police and volunteer fire. Penalties are increasing for those drivers found to be engaged in so-called distractive driving, but with the new law, the next six months will provide a grace period. Drivers who are not eligible for the exemption will only be issued warnings while the state launches a public education campaign about the change in enforcement. With this law, Ohio joins the ranks of other states where exemptions were granted for amateur radio use while driving, including Indiana, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Washington State, to name a few. The United States has begun work on the deployment of a new long-range, over-the-horizon radar system for the United States Air Force, which will be placed on the Pacific island of Palu. The sensor station, known as the Tactical Mobile Over-the-Horizon Radar, or TACMOR, will be set up on the highly strategic island of Palu. The sensor station intends to improve the situational awareness of U.S. and Allied forces operating in the region in the air and maritime domain. The Department of Defense announced on December 28th that it had granted Gilbane's federal business a $118.4 million contract to develop the structural foundation of a new U.S. Air Force radar station to be built in the Republic of Palau. The Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command Pacific acts as the contracting activity for what is known as the TACMOR Infrastructure Project. The work is anticipated to be finished by June 2026. Over-the-horizon radars are radar systems that can locate highly distant targets beyond the range limit of conventional radars. They operate in the HF frequency band of 5 to 30 megahertz and can detect objects hundreds to thousands of kilometers away. These radars employ powerful radio signals transmitted by a big antenna or an array of antennas. Similarly, using a high frequency sounder antenna and a backscatter sounder, TACMOR will transmit high frequency over the horizon flight information. The system will also complement another air and maritime domain awareness radar station in Palu, which was announced in 2017. 
The data gathered by TACMOR will be forwarded to an off-site operations control center via a secure, undisclosed receiver site. Their control center can access real-time target tracking and extraction data to support combatant command tasks. A modern over-the-horizon radar on PALU can support space-based and terrestrial sensor and weapon systems. The system will likely function to cue and provide early warning of approaching ballistic, cruise, and hypersonic weapons, as well as enemy ships and aircraft. In particular, over-the-horizon radar makes it possible to continuously monitor certain areas without deploying numerous types of radar systems over an extensive area at any given time on the ground, in the air, or at sea. The system's development, testing, and acquisition, together with the addition of related components, will give warfighters the capacity to fill in surveillance coverage gaps in crucial Pacific regions of significance to the United States and our allies, the document reads. The long-range radar is another signal of increasing U.S. alertness in the Pacific. All in all, the system could be crucial for monitoring Chinese and North Korea's activities. The next community meeting for Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, will take place on Saturday, January 21st, at 1700 UTC. The Zoom meeting will cover ARDC's 2022 grants, introduce new advisory committee members, and report on the recent assessment of 44.NET usage and technology. Topics to be discussed will include a review of ARDC's 2022 grants, introduction of the new grants advisory committee and technical advisory committee members, and a report on the recently concluded 44NAT assessment. To register for the meeting, go to www.ampr.org forward slash community hyphen meeting hyphen registration. Once again, that's www.ampr.org forward slash community hyphen meeting hyphen registration. The Zoom information will be emailed to everyone who has registered a day or two before the event. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communication. The organization got its start by managing the AmperNet address space, which is reserved for licensed amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to advances that benefit the general public, including the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technology is available through open source hardware and software and where anyone has the ability to innovate upon it. To learn more about ARDC, go to www.ampr.org. A frosty landscape surrounded the antennas at the high-frequency active auroral research program site in Gakona, Alaska on Tuesday, December 27, 2022. The high-frequency active auroral research program, or HARP, conducted its latest ionospheric experiment of bouncing radio signals off an asteroid passing near Earth's orbit. Amateur radio operators and radio astronomy enthusiasts were invited to monitor the test and send the results to HARP for analysis. While the results of the experiment will take several weeks, Jessica Matthews, HARP Program Manager, said the help was greatly appreciated. So far, we have received over 300 reception reports from the amateur radio and radio astronomy communities from six continents who confirmed the HARP transmission. HARP officials say the results of the experiment could aid efforts to defend Earth from larger asteroids that could cause significant damage. We will be analyzing the data over the next few weeks and hope to publish the results in the coming months, said Mark Haynes, lead investigator on the project and a radar systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. This experiment was the first time an asteroid observation was attempted at such low frequencies, he said. This shows the value of HARP as a potential future research tool for the study of near-Earth objects. The University of Alaska Fairbanks operates HARP under an agreement with the Air Force, which developed and owned HARP but transferred the research instruments to the University of Alaska in August of 2015. We may only be in January, but two clubs in the northeastern United States are already deep in the planning stages of campouts that combine eyeball QSOs with summit activations. The Northeast Summits on the Air Club has scheduled its first campout for the spring, 
Hams will be meeting up in Woodstock, New York, which is nestled in the Catskill Mountain region. The campout will take place between May 19th and May 22nd. Amateurs will be able to use one of the 45 campsites available at the Woodland Valley Campground. There is also an option to bring an RV. The club is advising early reservations for those planning to attend. Meanwhile, east of the Catskills, campers are also looking forward to returning to the White Mountains of New Hampshire for the 6th annual W1 Soda Campout. These summits on the air enthusiasts will be gathering from June 1st to June 5th. One of the organizers, Bob, AC1Z, writes on the Summits on the Air Reflector, Join in for the entire four-night campout or for as many nights as you can, or just stop by for a while. You can email Bob, AC1Z, for further details or just to let him know about your plans. Three of the four new astronauts on February's planned launch of the SpaceX Crew-6 mission to the International Space Station are amateur radio operators. Pilot Warren Woody Hoberg, KB3HTZ, Commander Stephen Bowen, KI5BKB, and Mission Specialist Sultan Al Nayad, KI5VTV. They'll join Mission Specialist Andrew Fadev on board the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft Endeavor. The spacecraft will be atop a Falcon 9 rocket, and while a launch date has not been selected, the earliest date would be mid February 2023. All crew members have learned about amateur radio on the International Space Station, received guidance on studying and testing, learned how to operate the ARIS radios, and the basics on the air protocol for ARIS team members at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The crew will be able to participate in ARIS using the ham radio station on the International Space Station to contact schools and other educational institutions. ARIS is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the U.S., participating organizations include NASA, the ISS National Lab, ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and AMSAT. And now, here is our tech guy, Rich DeMuro. What is going on? I'm Rich Tamiro, and this is Rich on Tech. Now, you're probably wondering, what happened to Leo? If not, thanks for knowing who I am, and please, let's keep it that way. Leo Laporte has retired, and after 19 years, he finally gets to enjoy his weekends. And now, I'm the new guy. That's right, you've got me for your guide for all things technology. And now, you are in for something special. I mean... Every day, you know, things happen, things change, but this is the first. This is the very first episode of Rich on Tech. All right, so a little bit about me, all right? I'm just a regular person who loves tech. I've always loved tech. I mean, I've been thinking about technology since I was a kid. Uh, I remember waiting to get on the internet, this thing called the internet when AOL was a thing. And AOL was sort of this, uh, you know, it was part of the internet, but not really. And I waited every day as a kid for that little internet link on AOL to light up. That's how nerdy I was. I'm originally from New Jersey, right outside New York City. And uh, my typical job throughout the last uh, couple decades has been a TV reporter. And I started out as a reporter, as you would, in a small market, Yakima, Washington. I moved my way up to Shreveport, Louisiana. Then I went to Los Angeles. Then I went to New York. And then I came back to Los Angeles. And in that time where I really cut my teeth as a tech person was at CNET in New York City. And wow, what a fun place to work. I mean, to be Go from looking at a website like CNET to actually being on a website like CNET. I got to see it all. I got to do it all. I was there for the launch of the iPhone in New York City in 2007. It was such a phenomenal time. I can still remember being in the Apple store on that launch day like it was yesterday. Uh, now I've been covering tech for more than a decade at KTLA TV in Los Angeles, and it has been so much fun. I wake up early. You know, I talk to people. I've traveled around the world doing my job to countries uh, including China, uh, including Japan, Ireland, England, Spain, Portugal. I mean, you name it, I've seen tech in different places. And what I love about that is that 
you know, we grow up here in America and we see how we do things. But when you go to other places, you see how other people do things. And it could be a little bit different than the way we do stuff. So it gives you depth. It gives you perspective. I mean, I don't have all the answers. I don't wake up and just know everything there is to know about technology. I explore and I figure it out. And I also know the ways to figure this stuff out. And that really helps me out. I'm on a journey just like you with all of this stuff. You know, I get a gadget for Christmas and I got to figure it out just like you. I've got a wife, I've got two kids, I've got a full-time job. I've got a lot to juggle. And, you know, reading the manuals has never been my forte. I kind of like to figure it out as I go along. And in 2023, I'll be figuring out how to get organized. Uh, like digital photos and files, they become a mess, just like yours have, I bet. I've got Google Drive, I've got Apple uh, cloud storage. I've got uh, my phone. I've got all kinds of things in different places. And I want to figure out how am I going to dedupe? How am I going to organize? That's my goal this year. Also, how to become more productive, how to keep track of my notes. I've been journaling on a daily basis, which is really fun. Uh, what's the best to-do list app? I've been trying to figure that out. My hope with this show is to inspire you. It's to make you smile. It's to make you think. But one of the biggest problems I see is hackers getting passwords. And 99% of the time, we hand over our passwords to the hackers through a phishing attempt. And those phishing emails that you get, you're listening to a tech podcast, so you may be a little more savvy than a lot of people, but the fact is you've got someone in your family or friends that is not as savvy as you. And these are the people that fall for this stuff. And it's your grandma, it's your mom, it's your dad, it's a friend, it's a relative. And these are smart people that are doctors, they're lawyers, they're architects, they're journalists, they're teachers, whatever. They're smart in their aspect. They may not be as tech savvy as you are or as I am. And that's what happens. So what happens is you get this email and there's some sort of what uh, this expert I talked to calls a stressor event. Hey, you got you to gotta change your password right now or your account was just logged in from somewhere. You need to help you know, uh, lock this down or your Amazon account was just used to purchase this. So you better go in and fix that. And before you know it, when you try logging in to fix it, they've already taken your password and they're off and running and they're, they're messing things up and they're somehow either, you know, screwing with your stuff or you know, just, they can do a lot of damage. So what do you want to do? You want to make sure that you do not fall for that social engineering. Don't get tricked. So learn to spot the signs of a phishing email. Sometimes it's not always that easy. So and tell your friends and family members about this. That's the other thing. It's like educate your friends. You know, talk about this stuff. I know you're out to, to a beer with your friends. Like, <laughs> just say, hey, uh, do you know how to spot a phishing email? Because uh, I think you should know. And just, you know, see the reaction on their face and be like, I know. I listen to Rich on Tech. That's what he talks about. Um, the other way that your password gets out into the wild is when a website is hacked. And this happens. This has happened to me many times. You sign up for one website, they are hacked, and next thing you know, that, that password and email combination is floating around on the web. It might be on the dark web, it might be a little tough to access, but these hackers know how to find this information. And then they go ahead and they try that password and username on a whole bunch of different websites. Common websites, you might use Gmail, they try it there. Yahoo, you might try it there. They might try it on a banking website, and they just keep going. And of course, you know, they're not sitting there necessarily trying to log in. They're using automated systems that can do this stuff very fast in a big way. And so uh, this expert I talked to, Roger Grimes, by the way, who is an excellent expert from the software training company or security awareness training company, Know Before, he said that twice a year, your password is probably stolen from a website that you belong to. And this is why you don't want to reuse the same password over and over. People say, ah, I've got my password. I use it. It's the same password I've had for years. Don't, don't do it. I mean, literally, you're putting yourself at so much risk if you're reusing the same password over and over. It's just not worth it. Take the five minutes to sign up and understand how to use a password manager. Take the five minutes to turn on two-factor authentication. The first thing that I ask people when they get hacked, I say, did you have two-factor on? They said, no. I've been talking on the news about two-factor authentication now for 10 years. And still, when I ask people, a lot of people have not turned it on. Turn it on, set it up. The best way to do it is with an authentication app. Look up one of those. Microsoft offers one. Google offers one. There's a couple other companies that offer them. That's the best way to do it. So you're not tied to your phone number. Oh, let's see. What else? Um, this expert was telling me that the passwords that you think you make up 
that you think are tough for hackers to guess are very easy. They can guess 16 to 18 character human created passwords all the time. Now, if you're using a password manager, if it's a totally random password, as far as they know, 11 or 12 perfectly random passwords are uncrackable at this point. So that's why when you've got all those crazy passwords on the, uh, sorry, if you hear some, uh, some commotion in the background, we are fostering two kittens right now and they are just running all over the room. So it's, uh, <laughs> they're getting into this playful state. When we first got them, we had to nurse them to health. They were so tiny but and, and so scared, but now they are turning into the, the kittens that you know and love, but they are eating my wires. They are playing around. They're yeah, just put put your mouth on that uh, that USB C cable. Okay, cl- climb on my router. <laughs> the the one kitten is now that we've got two. The kitten is sitting on top of my Euro, so I'm sure the Wi Fi signal just took a big nosedive. Uh, let's see what else. They are cute though. I will say it's a lot of work, but put giving them medicine and all this stuff. But it is cute and it's fun to do. The kids love it. Uh, okay, where was I? So. The passwords that you want to use from a password manager, 11 or 12 characters, going to be perfect, going to be a good password. The other thing is if you, like, let's say on your computer at work, and I understand why you may not want to use a password manager, because your computer at work, you're logging in 30, 40, 50 times a day, right? Every time you leave to get up from your computer, you should be locking it. Every time you come back, you want to unlock it, and that probably requires your password. So I get it. You probably don't want to put in a 12-character randomly generated password. So you want to use a password that's a little bit more familiar. And so in that case, use something what's called a password, a passphrase. And a passphrase is something like Johnny jumped over the big blue fence wearing overalls. Now, it may not have to be that long, but something to that effect. It's, a, it's almost like a sentence that you can remember. I love eating ice cream in the summer. Don't use that because that's too, um, that's too easily guessable. Um, so passphrases, very smart, and that's, that's what I would use. The other, thing, uh, the other thing I didn't mention is the other way that these hackers get your password is unauthorized password resets. And so if, you get, if anyone ever asks you to read them a number that you get like a text confirmation, just don't believe it. And I, you know, it's funny because again, I, and I've talked about this on the podcast in the past, these hackers basically reverse engineer the, the security measures that companies have put in place to protect us. So what happens is if you ever use, let's say PayPal, and and let's say you don't log in for a long time, PayPal will say, Hey, uh, we noticed you logged in. Can you please um, enter the phone, enter the six digit code that we just texted to your phone. And so that's put in place to make sure it is who you are who you say you are when you go to use PayPal after not using it for a year. Now, on the flip side, what the hackers will do is they'll call you up and they'll say, hey, um, Mr. DeMiro, we noticed that your PayPal account has been hacked, so we need to fix it. And just to confirm you are who you say you are, we just texted you a code to your phone. Please read us that code. And what they're actually doing is a password reset So they've got your password because it's already been hacked in some other way. And they send that password reset code to your phone. Now you read them back that code, they enter it in the website, and now they've taken over your account. So that's another way that they get access. You just have to be on your toes. And this stuff, I'm telling you, is just stuff. This is why I talk about it because you just have to know about it. It's really, it's very tricky. And that's what they do is they they really try to trick you. So be, be on the lookout for that kind of stuff. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. The Service Academy's radio group, known as SARGE, was recently formed for alumni and amateur radio operators who are interested in the five U.S. military academies. John Ross, KD8, IDJ is at League Headquarters and files this special report. William Curry, W5CQ, founder and net control operator for the Sarge Net, said two months ago there was a new interest in forming a group in net. He noticed that only one military academy, West Point, W2KGY, still was operating a club station. At one time, every military academy had an operating club station. The club stations at the U.S. Military Academy, U.S. Naval Academy, U.S. Air Force Academy, the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, and the U.S. Maritime Academy have all been off the air now for some time, said Curry. But now we have 50 new members who are all interested in promoting amateur radio at all of the academies. 
The Sarge Net meets every Thursday at 2200 UTC on 7.280 megahertz and every Saturday at 1600 UTC on 14.338 megahertz. All amateur radio operators, whether they are veterans or just have an interest in the military or history of the academies, are invited. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Curry has been licensed since 1950 and holds an amateur extra class license. He is also an ARRL life member. For additional information about the Service Academy's radio group NET, contact Curry at W5CQ at ARRL.net. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. The technician license is by far the most popular class of license now held in the amateur community. So many new hams started at the technician level to the extent that the novice license was eliminated as unnecessary. The amateur community accepts the technician as an acceptable mainstream license, either as a stepping stone to a higher class license or as an end in itself. But it wasn't always like this. For the first 25 years of the technician class license existence, it was an official outcast set apart by the FCC as separate and distinct from the other amateur classes. Why were technicians considered second class? To answer this question, we must go back to 1951. On July 1st, 1951, the FCC replaced the Class A, B, and C licenses with the Advanced, General, and Conditional classes and created three new licenses, the Extra, Technician, and Novice. The FCC was specific about the purpose of the technician class license as shown in the following quote. This class was established expressly for serious-minded experimenters who need spectrum space in which to air test their equipment. It was not established as a communication service and should not be regarded as a stepping stone between the novice and the general operator classes. The technician class of amateur license has as its purpose the provision for the serious-minded amateur experimenters to explore the higher frequencies and otherwise contribute to the art. Thus, the technician was an experimenter, not a communicator. For this reason, the FCC initially allowed technicians privileges only on frequencies above 220 megacycles. The FCC did not intend for the technician to engage in casual conversations on the air, other than allowing the technician to simultaneously hold a novice license, which at that time was valid for only one year and non-renewable, it was expected that the technician operator would stick to experimentation, not communication. Although many of the early technicians were indeed pure experimenters, many others obtained the license as a means to communicate without having to pass the 13 words per minute code test. These technician communicators became restless with the limited frequencies available above 220 megacycles, and they wanted access to the more mainstream VHF bands at 6 and 2 meters. They were joined by a small number of technician experimenters who also wished access to 50 and 144 megacycles for the purpose of studying sporadic e-skip, building equipment for these bands, or even using their license for radio control. Thus, in early 1955, a proposal was submitted to the FCC to allow technicians access to 6 and 2 meters. Knowing that the FCC regarded the license as an experimental one, these proposals avoided mentioning communication. Rather, phrases such as greater experimentation were used. The ARRL supported technician access to 6, but not 2 meters. In announcing their decision, the ARRL stated that 6 meters was far less occupied than 2 meters and could use the influx of technicians to study the band and thus contribute to the greater understanding of the unique characteristics of 50 megacycles. The ARRL went on to say that permitting technicians on 2 meters would appear to make the technician license too attractive. Many amateurs also wrote the FCC on this. Some said that technicians should have the full access to all frequencies above 50 megacycles, while others opposed the move, citing the FCC's original intent for this license and expressing fears that by allowing technicians to use 6 and 2 meters, they would become mere communicators. On April 12, 1955, the FCC amended Part 12, 
not Part 97, of the rules and regulations to give the technician class operator six, but not two meters. The fears of those opposed to technician communicators were amplified in 1958 when, at the peak of the sunspot cycle, thousands of technicians used F-layer skip on 50 megacycles to work vast amounts of DX, with some earning the Worked All States Award. Nevertheless, allowing technicians on 6 meters had a beneficial effect. It helped populate a band that was underutilized and it allowed a greater study of E and F-layer skip. For this reason, early in 1959, another proposal was submitted to the FCC to allow technicians full access to the 144 megacycle band. This time the ARRL agreed. They stated that things had changed since 1955 and technicians on two meters would benefit not only the advancement of the radio art, but would also allow all classes of amateur licenses to share at least one voice band in common as novices had access to the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of two meters. Despite the ARRL's support of technicians on two meters, there was opposition. Again, the argument as to the purpose of the license was brought up. Many amateurs wrote to the FCC stating that a technician was an experimenter, not a communicator, and that the license should not be used for routine exchange of communications. One ham complained that technicians were rag-chewing and not experimenting. A few amateurs not only wanted technicians kept off of 144 megacycles, but asked the FCC to incorporate their statement as to the purpose of the license into Part 12, presumably so that technicians caught communicating rather than experimenting could be fined or have their licenses suspended. Others, including the ARRL, did bring in valid experimental reasons to allow technicians on two meters. Once again, the FCC compromised. They restated their official position that a technician was an experimenter, not a communicator. However, they acknowledged that VHF studies could be made on two meters and that it was beneficial to have one common meeting ground for all classes of license. Thus, on August 21st, 1959, Part 12 was amended to allow technicians access to the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters, the same subband that the novices had. And so, technicians entered the 1960s as a distinctly second-class license. They were not eligible for racy station authorizations. They could not hold many ARRL appointments. And, despite the ARRL support of full technician access to all frequencies above 50 megacycles, the FCC's official position had not changed. Although no technician was actually ever fined or suffered a license suspension for the crime of communicating, many hams felt that technicians were merely glorified CBers who were violating the spirit, if not the letter of the law. In our next installment, we will see how a new, short-lived VHF magazine and an official change in the ARRL's viewpoint helped to bring about a gradual acceptance of technicians as real amateurs. I hope to see you then. Bruce Page, KK5DO, has found his weekly AMSAT report. And did you know you are now able to earn worked all zones on satellite? The current FM satellites for the U.S. only allow you to work about 16 CQ zones. Jump on IO-117 digital, and you can work the others. Hector W5CBF earned WAZ satellite number 42 exactly doing that. This also means that you are able to earn DXCC on satellite by augmenting your contacts with some digital ones. This week, Paul N8HM worked the linear transponder on FO118, which has a 15-meter uplink and a 70-centimeter downlink. He used an FT817ND to an Alex Loop Walkham portable magnetic loop with only 5 watts. Sounds like a very nice portable station for that satellite. Remember, the satellite also has an FM transponder. And January 24th is the second anniversary of the UVSQ sat. The FM transponder will be turned on with no PL tone, 145.905 MHz for the uplink and 437.020 MHz for the downlink. It is time for the Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that sunspot numbers are up and geomagnetic disturbances are down. What could be better? Okay, maybe cycle 19, but that was 66 years ago and by far the all-time largest sunspot cycle. 
But this is now. We are in cycle 25, and this sunspot cycle is emerging better than the consensus prediction. It is predicted to peak 30 months from now in the summer of 2025. Solar cycles tend to ramp up quickly and decline slowly, so we can look forward to great propagation for years to come. There were six new emerging sunspot groups in our reporting week, January 5th through the 11th. The first two appeared on January 5th, the next on January 8th, another on the 9th, and two more on January 10th. The average daily sunspot number rose from 97 to 135.9, and the average daily solar flux from 157.8 to 181.2 compared to last week. The average daily planetary A and dice declined from 15.4 to 6.7, and the middle latitude A index went from 10.9 to 6.1. Large sunspot groups on the sun's far side, detected by helioseismology after the beginning of this year, showed that the region of active heliographic longitude gradually approached the eastern limb of the solar disk. Solar activity increased after their arrival. Solar flux rose from 146 on January 2nd to 195 on January 11th. Compare the solar numbers to last year. A year ago, the average daily sunspot number was only 42.4 versus 135.9 now, and the average daily solar flux was 101.6 versus the reading of 181.2 now. 10 and 12 meters now have openings every day. So taking a look at the predicted solar flux, it'll be 210 on January 14th, then 208, 206, and 204. When was the last time we saw these numbers? On January 15th through the 17th, 200 on January 18th and 19th, then 180, 160, 130, and 135 on January 20th through the 23rd. And it'll be 140 on January 24th through the 26th. Looking at the predicted planetary A and dice, it'll be 10 and 8 on January 13th through the 15th, 5 on January 16th through the 17th, then 10, 8, 10, and 8 on January 18th through the 21st, 5 on January 22nd through the 24th, and then 8, 22, 12, and 8 on January 25th through the 28th. In radio sport contesting, January 11th through the 17th, the VHF UHF FT8 activity contest continues. January 14th, the YBDX contest, that's phone. On January 14th through the 15th, the UBA PSK 63 prefix contest, that's digital. And on January 14th through the 15th, the North American QSO party, that is CW. And later in the month, on January 21st through the 23rd, the ARRL January VHF contest. And you can visit the ARRL contest calendar anytime for more contest opportunities at ARRL.org. Some upcoming section, state, and division conventions. January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Convention. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. January 20th through the 21st, the Cowtown Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL North Texas Section Convention. That's in Forest Hills, Texas. January 27th and 28th, the Capital City Ham Fest 2023, hosting the ARRL Mississippi State Convention. That's in Jackson, Mississippi. And on January 28th, Winterfest, hosting the ARRL Midwest Division Convention. That's in Collinsville, Illinois. And you can search anytime the ARRL Ham Fest and Convention Database to find events in your area. The long-awaited Bouvet Island D Expedition team has added new operators to its ranks. Two Norwegian radio operators who are now part of the D-Expedition intend to operate from the island under their own calls for a limited time. Germund 3Y-LB5GI and Erwan 3Y-LB1Q are scheduled toward the end of the 3Y0J team's expected 22-day activation late this month. The news was reported on January 1st on the website dxworld.net, which gave confirmation from Ken, LA7GIA, co-leader of the Bouvet team. Ken said that this would be the first time any Norwegian with an LB call sign operated from Bouvet. The game plan is apparently to have 3Y0J pilot stations inform eager DX hunters when the pair get on the air. Spectra Rep has released the results of a successful demonstration of the advanced emergency data casting features of the next-gen broadcast ATSC 3.0 television standard that was done during the 2022 U.S. Marine Corps Marathon. 
Working with the Sinclair Broadcast Group, SpectraRep deployed its Incident 1 Datacast solution using the NextGen Broadcast standard to deliver encrypted video, alerts, and file sharing among eight public safety agencies. Those agencies included the DC Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. All data was delivered securely over the air without the need for internet, voice radio, or wireless cell data transmission services via SpectraRep's proprietary Incident 1 Datacast solution to support a robust security environment, the company said. Incident 1 Datacast is an enterprise-grade wireless emergency communications solution that uses the power of the next generation of over-the-air digital television technology to deliver operational and crisis incident data quickly and securely, the company said. For the Marine Corps Marathon, SpectraRep utilized ATSC 3.0 digital broadcast spectrum from their broadcast partner, Sinclair Broadcast, to deliver emergency communications securely. The Incident 1 Datacast solution layered a secure wireless network on top of existing communication procedures to facilitate interagency sharing of data during the marathon, the company reported. Prior to the marathon, SpectraRep deployed Incident 1 Datacast software and datacasting receivers from their technology partners, Digicap and West Pond Technologies, in multiple capital region agency facilities and vehicles. Sites ranged from hardened command posts to mobile command vehicles deployed across the District of Columbia and Northern Virginia. Encrypted streaming video, files, and alerts were transmitted over WIAV TV a Sinclair Broadcast Group next-gen broadcast-enabled station to agencies equipped with Incident 1 receivers connected to television antennas. Select agencies used an online dashboard to view multiple cameras from participating agencies or received targeted video over the air, SpectraRep reported. One of the most important benefits of ATSC 3.0 data casting is that it is a significant enabler in the delivery of emergency information. With ATSC 3.0 data casting, public safety departments can communicate and exchange alerts without having to rely on cellular systems that can become overloaded at large-scale events. Mark Aitken, president of Sinclair Broadcast Group's technology subsidiary One Media 3.0, noted that the next-gen broadcast TV standard is a tremendous advancement to the industry, especially when it comes to using it for emergency communications. Broadcasters around the country can provide this advanced technology to help save lives. The marathon hosted over 30,000 participants involving public safety organizations from multiple states and localities. Eight local and federal agencies incorporated data casting into their emergency management enforcement and communications toolkit. One notable outcome of the demonstration was that participating agencies successfully shared and received encrypted streaming video, targeted alerts, files, and information delivered over the air in ATSC 3.0 without voice radio, internet, or LTE cellular service. Another major takeaway was that multiple agencies were able to receive the same alerts in real time during the marathon, including one notification about a runner missing from the designated course with description and other identifying information. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the many questions that new amateurs ask is, when should I get on air and on what band? The often heard reply is just to get on air and make some noise. As time goes by, the importance of this seems to fade in favour of using HF prediction tools. Some amateurs never venture beyond that point, relying almost exclusively on technology to determine if they should turn on their radio or not. If you search the internet for current HF conditions, you'll end up with dozens of sites boldly claiming to provide precisely that information, some even using the label real time. You'll find instructions from countless self-proclaimed experts 
on how to read propagation conditions from their favourite site. There's even widgets that you can install on your website displaying propagation data per amateur band with helpful labels like band closed or showing conditions as poor, fair or good. Some of these widgets even include an embedded timestamp to prove just how current the information is. If that's how you decide to activate your amateur station, like I once did, I have some questions. Where is this information coming from? Is it accurate? And when was it last updated? To give you an idea of just how complex this question is, consider visiting two popular websites, solarham.net from Canada and spaceweatherlive.com from Belgium. On their homepages, you'll find all manner of numbers, charts, photos, events, notifications, alerts and warnings, each related in some way to HF propagation and the condition of the sun. Sounds great. Excellent resources. Job done. Well, no. Let's start simple. Location. Leaving aside where the site's owner is, or where the servers are, both potential sources of confusion, consider where you are and where the remote station is that you're trying to contact. Now compare that with the propagation data location. Do you know where the measurements came from, and if they're relevant to you? What about data currency, for example? If you can see the sun, you can count the number of sunspots since that data comes from physically looking at the sun. Mind you, can someone count the number of sunspots at night? It's not a trick question. The sun isn't overhead for everyone all the time, and the data from any particular observer will be out of date at night. When was the count updated? Is it still actually current, let alone real time? Obviously, not everyone uses the same data source either. In case you're wondering, why are we counting by eye in the space age? It turns out that since Galileo more than 400 years ago, it's the most long-term reliable way to keep data consistent between observers and instruments, both of which often last only one or a few solar cycles. And it's also cheap. What about equipment changes and failures in data gathering? Geomagnetic activity isn't global. It's measured using a device called a flux gate magnetometer. Measurements from specific instruments scattered around the globe are combined into the planetary or KP index. You'll discover that locations used change over time, and when instruments are down, the numbers are estimated. But you won't see that unless you actually find and explore the source data. It's not just solarham.net and spaceweatherlive.com. It's pretty much every single site that shows any form of HF propagation or space weather information, even sites based in a specific country, like the Australian Space Weather Service, have many instruments scattered around Australia. If you happen to be near an actual instrument, where near is anything less than 500 kilometres away, how do you know if that instrument was actually online when a measurement was made? Even if the instrument near you is working, is the data relevant to the receiving station on the other side of the planet? If you look closely at the sites giving out current HF conditions, you'll discover that most of these don't even tell you where the data comes from, let alone if any of it was estimated to come up with their current reported values or recommendations. If you start searching for historical information, this problem gets bigger. You'll find many sites that claim to have data, but are invariably underfunded, are rife with broken links, out-of-date servers, and moved, deleted, and abandoned pages. If you unearth a data set, you'll discover that everyone uses a different standard to record their measurements. How do you even know if combined measurements are coming from the right column? Think I'm kidding? There are documents with warnings about different formats, calculations and dates on which these changed. Aggregating this data is challenging at best. So, is there a better way? Yep. You're not going to like it. Get on air and make noise. I can hear you groaning from here. It's not all bad. You can run your own beacon to see the conditions at your location. It's what started me down the path of installing a whisper or weak signal propagation reporter beacon and leaving it running 24-7. Currently, I'm focused on very weak 10 milliwatt signals. So far, it's been reported 3,685 kilometers away. If you visit the VOACAP or Voice of America Coverage Analysis Program website, 
you'll find a visualization of how FT8 propagation worked between ITU zones between 2017 and 2019. It's not current, but it's an excellent way to see how propagation data can be derived from actual contacts. What we really need are more beacon transmitters and online receivers. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. According to the Wireless Institute of Australia, hams in Australia will begin paying higher fees for amateur radio services from the Australian Maritime College starting on Monday, February 6th. The Australian Communications and Media Authority approved the fee increases of 5% to cover call sign services and amateur qualification procedures. The fees have been implemented in keeping with the government's cost recovery guidelines, which permit authorities to charge non-government entities for part or all of the costs involved in certain government activities, such as regulation or services. The Australian Maritime College manages amateur radio exam services for the ACMA at the proficiency levels of foundation, standard, and advanced licensed classes. Arnaldo de Jesus Coro Antich, CO0KK, passed away January 8, 2023. Coro was born July 2, 1942. He was a founding member since 1966 of the Federation of Radio Amateurs of Cuba, Federación de Radio Aficionados de Cuba. At the age of 12, Coro joined what was then the Radio Club de Cuba, the association that brought together radio amateurs in the capital in the late 1950s. The club provided a report of his passing from Horacio A. Negro Geoklieski, CX3BZ, and International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Emergency Communications Coordinator, Dr. Carlos Alberto Santa Maria Gonzalez, CO2JC, with translation from Tom Camp, DF5JL. Coro was a journalist and university professor, teaching at the Raúl Roa García Instituto Superior de Relaciones Internacionales and at the José Martí International Institute of Journalism. He was a member of the team of Radio Habana Cuba until his death. His program, DXers Unlimited in English, reached all corners of the world. His radio station was always ready to help in case of emergencies and disasters in our country and region. At the time of his death, he was the emergency coordinator for Area C of Region 2 of the International Amateur Radio Union. He received the National Radio Award in 2017. He was 80 years old. The coronation of King Charles III in Westminster Abbey this coming May has inspired the Worked All Britain Awards Group to create a year-long event honoring the new monarch of the United Kingdom and his Commonwealth realms. The King Charles III Coronation Award is open to any amateur radio operator who is able to log contacts within the various geographical squares inside the United Kingdom throughout 2023. Hams may operate on all licensed frequencies and modes to qualify. According to the group's website, the initial certificate will be awarded for 10 points. There are endorsements for each 10 after that. Finally, each multiple of 100 points earns the operator a new certificate and a trophy. Goodbye, Bluetooth! The most common short-range wireless data exchange technology as it's now set to face the threat of extinction unleashed by a scientist from Bankura, India, with his newer micro device that's set to serve the digital gadgets soon. The scientist has been offered the patent for a revolutionary wireless antenna that can help data transfer 100 times faster than Bluetooth. Called the Super Compact Ultra Wideband Antenna, the micro device was developed by Professor Srikanta Paul, who in October was awarded the patent right by Center's Patent Office, for which Professor Paul had applied in July 2013. Professor Paul said, this is the world's smallest antenna. It's size 14 millimeters by 11 millimeters, with about a 10 to 1 bandwidth. It has almost a constant impedance bandwidth, gain, and omnidirectional radiation pattern. An event known as Winter Heat started on January 1st and is running all month here in the United States. Winter Heat would suggest a name that contradicts itself. Instead, Winter Heat has grown to stand for an event that presents increasing opportunities for all amateur radio operators in the United States 
especially those with a technician class license. Now, in its fourth year, the month-long winter heat challenges amateurs to become active in the FM simplex band segments on VHF and UHF. The activity also attracts operators on Simplex DMR, D-Star, and Fusion. One of the organizers, John Fulton, K9AI, said that winter heat started mostly in Illinois in 2019, but has since spread to other Midwestern states and outward toward both coasts. John said that last year's event drew amateurs' participation in 38 states for a total of 134,000 contacts. Winter Heat makes its web-based logging and reporting system available to registered operators, and those operators can also view real-time statistics and propagation. Licensed hams who are interested in being part of Winter Heat this year can register to participate by signing up at hamactive.com. A well-known contester and leader in the amateur radio community has become a silent key. Known worldwide for personal contributions to groups advancing amateur radio, Fred Lown, K3ZO, was also an accomplished contester who was inducted into the CQ Contest Hall of Fame in 1993. Fred, a resident of Temple Hills, Maryland, became a silent key on January 3rd after falling ill in mid-December. According to various reports, at the time of his death, he had been diagnosed with an infection and COVID. A member of the ARRL's Maxim Society and a life member of the League, Fred had been a director of the Yasmi Foundation, which helps fund projects advancing amateur radio. His lifelong commitment to ham radio began in 1952 when he got his first license and was assigned W9SZR as his call. A retired Foreign Service officer, Fred was a member of the First Class CW Operators Club and the A1 Operator Club. He was also president of the National Capital DX Association and the Potomac Valley Radio Club. R-A-S-T, the Radio Amateur Society of Thailand, penned a tribute on its website to Fred, who also held the call sign H-S-0-Z-A-R. Fred had been a longtime advisor to the Radio Amateur Society of Thailand. He became one of the young organization's earliest supporters after its creation in the late 1960s, when his work as a United States Foreign Service officer assigned him to a post in Thailand. Tributes poured in on other websites, too. Writing on the reflector of the Potomac Valley Radio Club, Ken K4ZW said, There was just something about tuning the bands during a contest and hearing K3ZO. You knew everything was right with the ham radio world. Anyone who uses amplitude modulation on the bands knows the warm sound it brings to casual conversation and the historical importance of keeping alive the first amateur voice mode. The AM rally an annual celebration of this mode is returning to HF and 6 meters from February 3rd through to the 6th. It's not necessary to have a boat anchor for full carrier amplitude modulation. Modern radios, including software-defined rigs, as well as military radios, modified broadcast radios, and homebrew models are capable of helping operators take part in this event. Information about logging your contacts and noting your rig and your output power class can be found on the website amrally.com. There are suggestions on how to prepare, as well as a guide to where and when you can find the most active AM action going on, from 60 to 160 meters. AM cannot be used on 60 meters in the United States, however. As organizer Clark N1BCG said, it's a great opportunity for newcomers to try the first phone mode and for experienced ops to be the AM ambassadors. Congratulations to the students of Syria, University, and Indonesia following the deployment of their first satellite from the International Space Station. Known as SS-1 for Surya Satellite 1, the CubeSat was sent into space on its own successfully on Friday, January 6th. SS-1 is also Indonesia's first student-built satellite. The university undergraduates undertook the project with the support of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, which recognized it in the design competition in 2018. That achievement awarded it the chance to be deployed from the International Space Station. The CubeSat's mission is to test communication between an automatic package reporting system payload and the ground using the amateur radio frequency 145.825 MHz. 
The university students were inspired to undertake the project after seeing a presentation on amateur radio by the Indonesian Radio Amateurs Organization known as Arari. The popular annual event known as Ham Radio University returned this year as an online event and attracted international attendance. Saturday, January 7th, was a back-to-school day for more than 1,000 radio amateurs who signed up for a seat in the virtual classrooms of Ham Radio University. The Day of Education and Fellowship marked the third time this event has been held online since the first one was held on Long Island, New York, 23 years ago. The fact that it was held in a virtual space meant it could open its doors to visitors beyond the New York metropolitan area and welcome amateurs from Bulgaria, Germany, Lebanon, Greece, Thailand, and Korea, as well as many other nations. Organizers said that in all, 1,662 hams registered, and of those, 1,082 attended the free event, taking advantage of the various forums, which included software-defined radios, parks on the air, grounding in the ham shack, and the role of Raspberry Pi computers in amateur radio. Did you miss a forum or perhaps you weren't available to attend at all? This year's presentations were recorded and will soon be available for viewing on Ham Radio University's YouTube channel. Meanwhile, the hard work has already begun on next year's event, which organizers hope will be available as a combination of virtual and in-person classes. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, on April 21st, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, 
videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, the Chirong Mars rover went into hibernation in May 2022 to allow it to survive the Martian winter's low temperatures, dust storms, and sandstorms. Unfortunately, something appears to have gone awry. According to unnamed sources, teams on Earth have yet to receive a signal from the rover following its hibernation. Although it's unclear what the problem is, the source stated that sandstorms have seriously weakened Chirong's capacity to use its solar panels to generate power. The Tianwen-1 orbiter has also stopped responding, which makes matters worse. Before acting as a relay for the rover's communication, the orbiter first explored potential landing sites for Chirong. Since then, the Tianwen-1 orbiter has been conducting research on its own, including mapping and surveying the Red Planet. A Beijing-based source said ground control had encountered difficulty when downloading the latest data from the orbiting probe, which is equipped with two cameras, South China Morning Post wrote. Amateur radio operators have even noted that the Tianwen-1 ground stations appear to have stopped attempting to communicate with the orbiter. Tianwen-1 is China's first self-sustaining interplanetary mission. The probe, a hybrid orbiter, lander, and rover, launched from Earth on July 23, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tianwen-1 successfully entered orbit around Mars in February 2021 after traveling 292 million miles from Earth. Two other major missions, the NASA Perseverance rover and the HOPE satellite from the United Arab Emirates, also arrived at Mars days before Tianwen-1. All three launched within a window of opportunity when spacecraft launched from Earth would go to Mars faster and more effectively. However, there will be a lot for all three missions to do on Mars. Various satellite missions, including the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Express from the European Space Agency, and several Mars rovers from NASA may have discovered signs of water on or beneath the surface of the planet. However, the Xirong rover and the Tianwen-1 orbiter will both employ radar technology to look for even more proof of water pockets on Mars. Tianwen-1, like many space explorations, has a philosophical component. The term Tianwen, which is derived from the name of a well-known poem by one of the greatest poets of ancient China, Chu Yun, means questions to heaven, according to the team that developed the probe. The problems with Shirang and Tianwen-1 have not yet been addressed by the Chinese Space Agency. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Rich on Tech podcast, courtesy of Premier Networks, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, Parks on the Air and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the Internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.